Hey students, welcome back to Introduction to Ethics. I hope you're all doing well today. In today's PowerPoint, we'll be looking at part two of making ethical decisions, where we'll have a review of the seven steps on making ethical decisions, and then we will also do a class exercise in the video. Stay tuned for the PowerPoint. And, uh, we're going to run through those seven steps real quick before we get into our moral dilemma that we're going to be going through uh, here as, as a class. And I know it's on your computer screen and you're not really interacting with anybody in, in your class, but uh, just to walk through a dilemma together. Okay, so just quick review. Step one, gather the facts. Okay, and you see there on the screen, it's the same as we looked at last time. Uh, what do we know? What do we need to know? And you usually have time to gather this information. Number two, determine the ethical issues involved that cause the dilemma. Okay, so again, this is the X versus Y format like we talked about last time. Uh, there's probably going to be two or more competing moral interests at play in the dilemma. Step three, determine what virtues or principles have a bearing on the case. You need to list the virtues and, and, um, and moral values that are germane to the issue. This is where you're going to start seeing the biblical principles coming out, the Christian virtues coming out, um, and, and helping you to get this, uh, this step done. Uh, step four, list the alternative courses of action to resolve the dilemma. Again, some alternatives will be immediately ruled out. It's just like, no, I can't do this one because it's immoral. Step five, five eliminate alternatives. Uh, this is done based on the moral principles relevant to the case. Okay, and again, you want to get it down to all alternatives eliminated but one, the one that you want to stick with for your biblical ethic decision-making to solve this dilemma. All other alternatives you want to get rid of, uh, and, and that may be difficult. That's why we get to here, step six, uh, when a resolution dilemma is not produced in step five, you need to look at, as it says there in the middle of the screen, the consequences of the decision-making. And then step seven, the decision is made and acted upon. In all likelihood, the decision will still be difficult, um, and, and there's going to be there may be negative consequences uh, for the decision that is made. Okay, so now we are going to move through this class exercise together. And uh, as we go through the steps, um, you know, I want you to think about what you would say, and even and if you really want to um, get into this, which would be very helpful for you, uh, just if you have a piece of paper there, uh, just uh, pause the video at uh, at that step, jot down what you would think, and then hit play, and then we'll go through that step together. Um, but my point is that I want you to get to is just get the practice of running through a dilemma and using this uh, this method. Okay, so here we go, class exercise. The next slide poses an ethical dilemma. We we will use the seven-step method to solve the dilemma if we can. After all, it is a dilemma. Keep in mind, not all dilemmas will be cleanly solved. See step six of the seven-step method. Okay, so the purpose of this exercise is to get you to think about what makes up the steps for the seven-step method. Uh, this, that's the whole point, is to get you to think about it. Here's our dilemma, the runaway train dilemma. There is a runaway train barreling down the railroad tracks. Ahead on the tracks, there are people working on a trestle bridge. They are, number one, an expert bridge engineer with over 25 years' experience who is slotted to repair many other dilapidated bridges in the county. Number two, the beloved mayor of the town who wants to unveil phase two of his successful economic recovery for the town. He just came to see how the work is going. Number three, three workmen, a newlywed who was married last month, a grandfather retiring next month after 45 years of railway service, and a loving father of three kids and his wife is expecting their fourth child. So those are the people that are on that bridge. The train is headed straight for them. You are standing some distance off, and next to you is a train lever. If you pull this lever, the train will switch to a different set of tracks that will cross a parallel trestle bridge. You are ready to throw the switch but you suddenly notice that there are two kids on the other trestle bridge spray-painting graffiti. These two kids are, number one, a 15-year-old troublemaker who has no interest in school, has dabbled in drugs, and is known to steal from local businesses. Number two, a 13-year-old who comes from a loving family that are active in their local church, but recently he has been hanging out with some troublemakers to be cool. He's a good kid, but unfortunately had a fight with his mom that morning before leaving to meet up with the 15-year-old. In anger, his last words to her were, I hate you, before slamming the door. Even if you yell and scream, it's too late. If you leave the switch alone, the five men die. If you throw the switch, the two youth die. What do you do? 
Okay, so number one, step number one, gather the facts. Remember, what do we know? What do we need to know? And if you want to pause and jot some things down, you can. If not, you can just continue watching the video and, and we can go through this together and that's perfectly fine. Again, my point is that I want you to be able to use this uh, uh, seven-step method uh, for solving ethical dilemmas. Okay, so here's some facts that I, I put on the screen. So we, the facts are, there's a runaway train. Um, again, these are objective facts. This is what we know about the story. Uh, you're the only one that has an impact on the situation. There are five people on one bridge. There are two people on the other bridge. And then the next two points there, right in the very middle of the screen, it says the plain facts slash details of the five people and the plain facts slash details of the two youth. Again, that that's part of the story. Um, you know, if you jotted those some of those facts down. Um, so, you know, we, we know that uh, there are specific... Uh, attributes, there are specific descriptions of each person in this, uh, in this dilemma. Uh, another fact is we know people will die. doesn't matter what choice you make, people will die. Anything that we need to know, okay? Now here, we, there's no time to really gather more facts in this scenario because the train's coming and you've got to make a decision. Usually you're going to have time to be able to gather more facts of an ethical dilemma. But here's some things that we, we would like to know. Is there any other engineers that could do future repairs? Has the mayor's economic plan been revealed to anyone else, like maybe his subordinates? Uh, do the five men that are working, do they have life insurance? Uh, is anyone a Christian uh, that is uh, on, the, train, or on the, um, the bridge? Is anyone a Christian? So those are some facts that we can gather, and then maybe some that we would want to know or we would need to know to maybe help us make a decision better. Number two, determine the ethical issues involved that cause the dilemma, X versus Y formula. This is pretty simple. Okay, here's, our, here's what uh, step two looks like for us. X versus Y. Five lives in various stages of life versus two lives in various stages of life. So that's just one that I, I came up with and put down. Pretty simple. Step three. Determine what virtues or principles have a bearing on the case. The purpose of this step is to help you think through what virtues and principles you think should be satisfied by your decision. And here's where you start to bring in biblical principles. Okay, And you may come up with different ones than, than I have on the screen. That's perfectly fine. What virtues and principles have a bearing? Okay, so the first one. The five seem to be upstanding and beneficial participants in the community. So that's a virtue um, to be a benefit to the community. Society usually rewards upstanding citizens. There are more lives on this bridge, but again, as you look biblically, all life is valuable because God made it. Okay, But there's more lives on this bridge. The engineer has desired skills, education, experience, hard worker. I mean, those are good, um, good virtues uh, to have, uh, especially being a hard worker. Oh, that's, that's good. Uh, he's proven that throughout his life. Uh, mayor's policies are helping the community and they love him. So again, he's an upstanding citizen that he cares for the town. He, uh, maybe he cares for the poor of the town because of the economic uh, plan he has so that he's caring for the town. He has compassion on people. He's there to uh, see how the work is going. So he's interested in the community, interested that people do well. Uh, the newlywed, hey, he's, he is just starting out his married life. He has his whole life ahead of him. And um, you know to, you have to think about th that and these different principles. Uh, the retiree, doesn't he deserve to enjoy retirement after such loyal service? Uh, he's given 45 years of service to the railway. He should uh, uh, enjoy his retirement. And then the father of three whose wife has, is pregnant with the fourth, uh, you know, he needs to provide for his family. I mean, that's definitely a biblical principle that you need to provide for your family, uh, dad. So he's out there providing for his family. Let's look at the two youth. Now, they seem to be more of a detriment to society. We saw the facts of the case. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the one's a troublemaker and the other one is kind of falling into that behavior. Uh, society usually punishes those that are detriments to society, those that uh, cause problems in society. Uh, you know, society usually punishes people that way, breaking the law, and there's consequences. Uh, there are less lives on this bridge, but again, all life is valuable to God, and we see that in the scripture. Um, the 15 year old boy, uh, he doesn't care much for the community norms because he doesn't go to school. Um, he's vandalizing property, 
He's dabbling in drugs, which is bad for the community, bad for people. He's a bad influence on this other youth, probably a bad influence on others. Uh, he disrupts honest business by by stealing and and uh, just causing problems. So, um, you know, that those are some virtues that he has. Uh, the 13-year-old vandalizes property here by spray painting graffiti, uh, and he's being drawn into the negative behavior. So we see uh, some of these principles and virtues that have a bearing on the case as we think this through. Uh, you, some of them are pretty clear biblical um, principles, such as life is has value. Uh, you know, you want to be a hard worker. You, you have compassion on people. You know, so uh, there there are some biblical principles that come into play here. Number four, list the alternative courses of actions to resolve this dilemma. Are there any? And really, there are only two. Here are our alternative courses of action. You only have two choices. You either save the five and kill the two, or save the two and kill the five. Eliminate the alternatives. So here's the question. Can you eliminate one or more courses of action from step four? Can you eliminate any of these? And, of course, the answer is very difficult. So as you see on the screen there, uh, can you eliminate one from step four? Really, here, here's the next slide with the elimination. What choice would you get rid of? So you want to eliminate the alternative. So you don't throw the switch, which equals you scratch out throwing the switch. Therefore, five are going to die. Or you throw the switch, which means you get rid of don't throw the switch. Therefore, two die. And so the answer is, can you make the choice? And here's where we get to step six. I would assume that the answer, you know, you can't make the choice. You just don't know what to do. So this is required when a resolution to the dilemma is not produced in step five. And so again, I'm going to assume that you can't make that decision. You just don't know what to do. So now we have to look at the consequences. If virtues and values do not make the decision clear, then one needs to con consider the consequences. The option most beneficial and causing the least amount of harm needs to be given serious consideration. Okay, so in parentheses I put there, see page 112 and 113 in your textbook. Go ahead and open up your textbook there, reread that those two pages to get get an idea in regards to step number six. It's it's that's from the author, but the point is is that you need to look at the consequences of of the different sides of the dilemma. Step six, when a resolution of the dilemma is not produced in step number five, most positive consequences and least negative consequences. Again, this is a decision that you would have to make. Okay, I can't make that decision for you. We, I've, I've walked you through these steps. I can't make the decision for you. You're the one that has to make that decision. So in this case, what is the one with the most positive consequence and the least negative consequence? Is there any really? Step seven, the decision is made and acted upon. You must decide and act. Okay, so here we go. What did you choose? And so to try to make uh, bring a little bit more lightheartedness in this in this very uh, difficult dilemma um, here, uh, we have to think about it with that emoji, uh, the thinking emoji. Okay, so just to um, help you out here a little bit uh, about this dilemma. I just want to walk through this slide here with you. The runaway train dilemma was created by an English philosopher, Philippa Foote, in 1967. She was studying how people would react to an impossible situation. Okay, so um, this is, this is uh, very important to understand with this dilemma, the underlying part there. It is impossible. Just an FYI, uh, there is no solution to the train dilemma. Okay, we walked through that dilemma, and the whole point of it was to get you to think through the dilemma. But there is no solution. So no matter what you picked, I know someone, you know, it's either the five are going to die or the two are going to die. The point is, is that you thought through the dilemma for the best ethical outcome. Again, the last bullet point. This was an extreme example with no time to really think. Most dilemmas that we face usually have time to gather information and facts and to really evaluate things before coming to a decision. And again, most most extreme example, uh, this extreme example here, um, you know, where people are going to die. Most dilemmas um, might not come to that point, although there are some that do ethical dilemmas that do involve death such as abortion, such as euthanasia, um, uh, such as um, 
uh, capital punishment. Uh, the, so some of those dilemmas, they do involve uh, death. But in this extreme example of the runaway train, uh, it is a, uh, a dilemma where there is no solution. So, you know, don't feel bad if you, you know, not sure what to pick or whatever. The point is to get you to think through the dilemma for the seven steps. Okay, that's it for this uh, this PowerPoint. I do uh, hope that it was helpful. Again, this is the uh, the approach that we're going to be taking uh, for the moral choices um, that we have to make in uh, Introduction to Ethics for this class. So All right, class, that's it for today. In our next video, we'll begin a look at ethics at the beginning of life, which will be our very first topical study of ethics for this course. I'll see you then.